Good morning and welcome to Thy Strong Word, the program where each weekday morning we explore the Holy Scriptures through which God bespeaks us righteous and nourishes our faith. I'm your host, Pastor Phil Boo of St. John Lutheran Church in Laverne, Minnesota. Thank you for tuning in to Worldwide KFUO, Christ for you anytime, anywhere. Did you know that there are many ways you can listen in? You can listen in over the air at 8.50 a.m., online at kfuo.org or the KFUO app, or using your favorite podcasting app. That's right. Just search for Thy Strong Word or any of our fine programs. As always, I love listening from hearers, so if you have any questions or comments about today's show or you just want to say hi, I invite you to reach out to me via email at pastorboo at gmail.com. Be sure to tell me where you're listening from when you write in. Thy Strong Word is supported by the Lutheran Heritage Foundation. Be sure to visit them online at lhfmissions.org to discover all the amazing things that they're doing to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, let's begin because today is Thursday, August 18th, and we've finally reached chapter 5 in our study of Romans. Chapter 4, which we covered yesterday, uh, in chapter 4, which we covered yesterday, Paul revealed that Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. That would have been scandalous to Jews who looked to Abraham as the epitome of what it meant to be someone faithful to the law. And yet, was that crediting of righteousness before or after he was circumcised? And Paul says before. And that message for us, for Jews and for Greeks, is that we too are saved, not by our adherence to the law, but because of the faith that we are given in Jesus Christ. And he ended the entire chapter with just that, that it is counted to us who believe in Jesus because he was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. But today we continue to hear Paul's uh, explanation of this argument. And my guest for this morning is the Reverend Robert Moeller, Jr., who serves three congregations, the saints at Our Savior Lutheran Church in Pipestone, those at Zion Lutheran Church in Jasper, Minnesota, and those at St. John Lutheran Church in Trusky, Minnesota. Now, ordinarily, our guests call into the show or connect with us via the internet, but it is my pleasure to have Pastor Moeller right here in front of me, live and in person in KFUO's Laverne, Minnesota satellite studio, also known as my office, Reverend Moeller, welcome to the show. It's great to see you. Oh, it's very nice to be here as well. Tell me a little bit. You are at the Three Strands Parish. What does that mean? Who are you serving out there? Oh, we're serving three small congregations in, in rural southwest Minnesota. And uh, as we started talking about working together almost six years ago now, uh, that we I guess one of the things that we wanted to do that we, it wasn't a, a last ditch effort just to try to keep the doors open for a while, but but we wanted to to use the strengths from each other, and so we we took the passage from Ecclesiastes talking about three strands being much much stronger and 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 working together, and that's kind of where we've gone from that point. Well, that's awesome. Now I'm here. To, I'm in the same circuit as you. Full disclosure, and I'm here in Laverne, Minnesota. We're in the southwest corner of the state. So, how far is your farthest church from here in Laverne? The farthest one from here would be 29 miles. Okay, so that's not bad. Yeah, yeah. We have a handful of great Lutheran churches in this area, and just some amazing pastors. Uh, more of whom I hope to include in the future. I know Christopher Amon is also a pastor in Pipestone, Minnesota, at a different congregation. He's going to be on in just a few weeks. Great. Boy, I'm excited to have you on today. So we're going to be talking about Romans chapter 5. And so I'm going to read some of the verses to get us started. I will be reading from the English Standard Version of the Holy Bible. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have a peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him... We have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, and character produces hope, 
and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. That's a good place to stop. These are some very familiar words from St. Paul, and he begins with this idea of therefore, but then he continues with since we've been justified by faith. So take it from there. How How is Paul continuing the argument here that we are saved not by our works but by faith? Well, it's a little bit of a shift up to this time that he's been focusing on the topic of, of righteousness, who is righteous, and how does one become righteous. And, and with this chapter, kind of change the focus is to the life that results from from being righteous by faith. And so he starts to emphasize the, the benefits that justification through faith brings to us, such as peace and hope, victory over death, love of God, etc., that we'll talk about a little bit more. So those are things that we do, I guess they flow from faith, right? Because we sometimes will think of faith, as we discussed yesterday, we think of faith as something that we do as opposed to something that we are given by God. So to be justified by faith, if, if faith were a work that we must accomplish, that we must do, we must demonstrate or prove in some way, then that's really no different than keeping the law. But since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God. How is it that we have peace with God because of faith? Well, um, God, God made the, the first move with that, that that uh, the peace that we're talking about here, of course, is, is that we're no longer enemies of God who face the wrath of God. And kind of as you're in the first part of Romans, Romans chapter one, that that kind of starts with focusing where uh, where where we're beginning from, and and that's one of the amazing things about this that that God is reaching out to us even while we are even while we're enemies here, um, and so this is. Uh, this peace isn't just a, a feel-good kind of emotion in the heart of a believer, but it's actually an objective reality that it's God no longer holds his wrath against us for the sake of his Son. If God held his wrath against us, no one could stand. But at the same time, we still face sufferings in this life. You know, verse 3 says, we rejoice in our sufferings. How can sufferings be a good thing in the life of a Christian? Paul kind of goes on with uh, the, that it's a, a a process, if if you will, with the with the sufferings going on, on there. There's a, a sequence that that comes from it. Um, I guess part of this is is that we we can we know that we're under God's loving and gracious care. So even as we go through sufferings, that a lot of times that is when we really first begin to experience God's love and care in in a way that we that we really know because we realize our, our deep need and there's just nowhere else to turn. Unfortunately, we're too often the sinful nature in us is, is still wanting to depend upon ourselves a little bit. Yeah, without sufferings, there's really no reason for the sinful man to turn to God or to seek after something better. It, it, it sounds like here when Paul says we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that the suffering produces endurance and then so on. Like you said, there's this this process that we go through whenever we face sufferings in this life, God can use even those sufferings to our good. Lex Semper accuser, of course, the law always accuses, but sufferings in themselves can be law. It can remind us that we are outside of the perfect creation that God gave us because of sin in the world, and yet though we face sufferings, God can use these to eventually produce in us character and hope and hope which does not put us to shame. Tell us more about hope. Tell us more about how God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Well, the, that language right away, I guess when I first hear that being poured out, I, I can see that as the, the giving of the Holy Spirit and almost certainly that allusion to holy baptism in, in, which, um, in which we are uh, given those gifts of the Holy Spirit, uh, one of those gifts uh, being hope. It's an extension of faith is kind of how I would put it. Hope is for something that's in the future. Faith is, uh, faith oftentimes would be more now, but hope is, a, and it's not a, 
well, I hope so type of thing, like we'll also talk about that. That's kind of how we use hope often. But hope, hope uh, in Scripture is something that's certain. It's something that's been promised to us by God and so that we, uh, we can count on it. The way we currently use or I must most often use the word hope, we think of, well, boy, I sure hope it doesn't rain. For instance, we're having our worship service outside and then we will uh, we hope that it doesn't rain on our service but we're hoping in something that we don't know what will happen we don't know how what the future will hold but when the bible talks about hope hope that doesn't put us to shame i suppose a hope that puts us to shame in a simple human term would be i hope it doesn't rain and then of course it pours and people look at us and go well it was silly that you were hoping for that didn't the didn't you know that it had a 50% chance of raining or something? But I like how you said that, you know, hope is something that we can be certain of. We can put our hope in God's word or in what God has said because he is a God who keeps his promises. And we know that if he says it will happen, it does. And so that kind of hope really is related to faith and is an extension of faith, faith and believing of what God has done. Before we go on to verse 6, do you have anything else you'd like to talk about these first five verses? I think that was the main part. I was just kind of looking um, looking at my notes here. Sure. And uh, as I was looking, it kind of that hope part really does lead into the next next verses that we'll be, be yeah, looking let's, at Yeah, let's here. get into them then. I'm going to read a 6 through 11. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Wow, those are some really important gospel words from St. Paul here. Break those down for us, beginning with the first few verses. Um, I guess I'd look at the word that says Christ came when we were still weak. Mm. Uh, that even if we had wanted him to come, which was not the case most certainly, that we still couldn't have done anything positive to, to bring it about. Um, but the infinitely worse situation was that by nature we didn't want anything to do with God and his promised Savior because we were ungodly. Uh, kind of gets into the next part that emphasize not only were we weak, but we were ungodly. We were totally anti-God, uh, against God, working against God in our life. You know, and it reminds me too, you know, Paul has thus far been talking about righteousness apart from the law and how shocking that would have been to those who believed that they were righteous because they were descendants of Abraham or because they kept the law perfectly or very well. And so they wouldn't have considered themselves ungodly. They would have considered themselves God's people. So for Paul, which he has already made very clear in the previous chapter that we are all born as sinners and we're all ungodly in that way, nothing, including what nationality we're born to, including how good we try to keep the law, makes us godly. But the gospel then is that Christ died for the ungodly. But doesn't that also kind of inhibit our ability to share the gospel with people? Because if you were to tell someone out in the world that Christ died for you, I want to give you the gospel. And I don't want to be one of those people that talks about sin and law. I just want to give you the gospel. So I just want you to know that Christ died for you because Christ died for the ungodly. What do you mean calling me ungodly? I'm not ungodly. I'm a good person. I'm not a murderer. So we see at work here this necessity uh, this is why St. Paul is such a good Lutheran, to be both uh, clear about the law, proclaim it in its fullest severity, we think a CSW author, but also to proclaim the gospel in its full sweetness. But yeah, we see here Christ died for the ungodly. That could be heard as law or gospel. For us who recognize that we are ungodly in our fallen nature, oh, that's gospel. But for someone who isn't right, isn't ready to recognize that they are by nature enemies of God, 
then they might get offended. But yeah, you're right. This idea of being still weak and Christ coming and dying for the ungodly, that's some pretty controversial statements nowadays. Yeah, that's uh, if you don't realize your your need for a doctor, if you don't realize how sick you are, that you're you're not going you're going to refuse the, refuse that service when it's available to you, or when someone tells you, "Hey, you're not looking too good," uh, you're going to reject that. You're going to get offended. Yeah. So, God shows His love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Hey, we're good Lutherans. I think we both hear that as gospel, but explain a little bit maybe about how Paul is taking this argument. Well, kind of Paul really establishes that in the first chapters of Romans that that he really really hits on that, and he gets into the the whole list of of with the Psalms where he, where he's talking about that that no one no one is clean, and and, and there's some really terrible descriptions that that we think or that he comes up with that that come directly from the Psalms, the the same places where some of the people who would have been rejecting that idea of being ungodly in Paul's day, and Paul could point to, ah, go back to your scripture and look again here. And it, it tells you just what, just how well you're doing here. Yeah, I love how Paul is not ashamed. Of course, he's being inspired by the Holy Spirit, but he's not ashamed to say, I'm not just making this stuff up, guys. This is David talking, you know, or the Holy Spirit working through David or the Holy Scriptures, however they look at that. This is the patriarch Abraham who was brought in by faith, not because of his circumcision. He's he's always calling back to the core of who they admired and what they believed, as we do too, um, to prove that this isn't something new. When Jesus came, it's not something that – not God's plan B, but rather – his plan A from the beginning to send a savior, and that's who he's come. And so we then are justified not because of the law or works, but by his blood. And I guess the the point is here with that even if a person has all kinds of legal and logical reasons to expect help and support from others, that very rarely will someone step in to die for you. Uh, but uh, for a good man, that's Going back to say, uh, let's just suppose there was somebody, a good man, uh, probably speaking from civilly or something like that, that. As far as he knew that he he didn't kick cats around and he didn't do some things like that, that that uh, uh, you might you might step in, but but uh, certainly not for someone who was weak and who was ungodly. That the fact that somebody would do something like that just is amazing. I do love that though, how he's trying to make this very clear argument, and he says, one will scarcely die for a righteous person, but he does. He's kind of like, well, maybe, because I think he's anticipating an argument right. from somebody, yep. just what you're saying. They're like, well, wait a minute, there's this really great guy down the road, and I'd die for him. He's such a good guy. And so he's like, okay, fine. <laughs> maybe <laughs> someone would die for a really good person, but that's not the point, right? That we, is not that we're even good people. It's that we are sinners, and yet God died for us. That's an amazing message. Yeah, that if we want to, if you want to really know how how much God loves you, that is is definitely a picture of that. That uh, He's been what He's been willing for you to do for you uh, while you were weak, while you were ungodly, while you were opposed to Him. Christ died for you, and now now that salvation is there for you. In these last couple of verses in this section, he talks about while we were enemies, we were reconciled, right? Reconciled to God. Now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved? Uh, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Maybe talk about what this idea of reconciliation means. I mean, being an enemy of God is hard for people to get their minds around sometimes. We think about the little baby who's born, just cute and sweet and you know, uh, slobbering and crying, but also, you know, has all these great little emotions and you're starting to really love them. And we bring them up to the font and this pastor gets up and basically says, this, this person is an enemy of God. And of course, Christ is now going to reconcile them through this blessed sacrament. But what does it mean to be an enemy of God? And what does it mean to be reconciled? 
Well, kind of with that, that reconciliation here in uh, verses 6, 8, and 10, we have some statements that kind of go with that. Yeah. We have, while we were without strength, Christ died for the ungodly. Um, and that was in verse 6. And while we were sinners, Christ died on our behalf. Summary of verse 8. And while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Uh, reconciliation, probably the the best that I can example, human example that I can think of is that if you have a, a married couple who is struggling, for instance, in, in their marriage, and that they would that they would have someone come in to, to help them to join them back to join them back together when they ha- haven't been getting along. And the reconciliation that happens here is is between us and God and Jesus is that reconciler, uh, the, the one who comes in there to do that. So we are the ones who are on the uh, offending end of God, and we're trying to get right with him, and we need a uh, uh, in-between. Uh, and God knows that. And so he has sent his son to be that intermediary, to be that that mediator between us and God to reconcile us. Of course, why does God you know, have to kill his own son, right? That seems so harsh to a world. But it is by the death of his son that we're reconciled. God, I suppose, requires that sin be uh, paid for. And the mercy is that we aren't called to pay for our sins, but rather he puts the wrath, he pours out that, that, that punishment for sin onto Jesus on our behalf. I think that's what's really amazing about the gospel message is that you know so many world religions are out there looking to um, work their way up, work their way into God's good graces. And even the Jews by this point had fallen into that trap of wanting to keep the law in order to please God so that they'll be saved. And Paul comes with this completely uh, backward to them but clarification of God's eternal plan, and that is that our reconciliation comes not because of our own efforts, because of Christ's. How can we apply this message to the world, right? What's the whiffum factor, the what's in it for me? When we talk about being enemies being reconciled, how do we in our churches and in your churches perhaps, how are we taking that message to our communities? Well, as always, the, the, the personal aspect of it is the, the best. Um, I guess one of the things that I was thinking about this week, because we've got, I've got two v, um, vacation Bible schools that are coming up in the, in the next couple of weeks, and in one in particular that has, for the the, sm- the smallest of all the towns has the, the largest of the v- vacation Bible schools, and we have quite a few there. But part of that is uh, especially because of, of one of our volunteers. She's worked with it for years, but she goes personally to the homes and, and in, invites them and, and talks with them, and she's um, be- very winning with that. And she's been doing it for, I think it was 45 years now that, that was talked about. And so we have, and these are, most of our kids aren't from our congregation that come there, but they're from the community. And uh, many of them, it's parents who went to vacation Bible school, remember what it, what it was like with Sharon. And so they, oh. and so they want to get their ki- have their kids come there. So they, they know they're, mi- they realize they're missing something, but they don't quite, they haven't quite gone for it. But it, it has helped. Uh, we have, um, with that outreach, it's given us opportunities then for working with the families, and, and it, it, it takes a while. It, you know, it really does because we have to build that relationship with folks so that they know that when we say things like we were enemies or that Christ died for the ungodly and we go to apply that to, say, them, that we're not doing it from a position that the world thinks of we're holier than thou, but rather like Paul – We're the chief of sinners. Mm -hmm. We know that Christ died for the ungodly and that that's a good thing because we are the ungodly, or I should say we're the ungodly, and that we were enemies of Christ and we are grateful for his reconciliation. When we come back, we are going to be continuing to explore Romans chapter 5. With me is my guest, Reverend Robert Moeller, and I am so excited to continue to this discussion. We'll see you on the other side of the break.
What's happening in Germany's Lutheran churches, where Iranian refugees are flooding through the doors? What new opportunities for sharing the Christian faith are arising in communist Vietnam, and how can my church play a part? Mission speakers, all LCMS pastors from the Lutheran Heritage Foundation, will come to your church, free of charge, to preach and lead Bible studies tying into this exciting work going on all around the world. To schedule your speaker, call LHF at 800-554-0723. Children loved by God, welcome back to Thy Strong Word on this beautiful Thursday, August 18th. With me today is the Reverend Robert Moeller, and we are in chapter 5 of Romans, but we are going to read just a few more verses as we continue our study. Beginning with verse 12, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned, for sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass, for if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. I think we can stop there. It's kind of in the middle of a thought, but we can pick it up when we get there. So, uh, therefore, just as sin came through the world into one man, he's talking about Adam. How is Paul changing the argument now? How is he continuing to pull from the Old Testament history, uh, the world history, we should say, to explain what's going on? I think part of it relates with what we were just talking bef before the break there as far as for people not necessarily recognizing their need, their, their sin, their ungodliness. And uh, Paul brings in death. Death is the, the, is the one proof of, of sin in, in everyone's life. Um, and it's the one thing that, that we all need to face at one point. Um, our death, the, the death of others as well, our, our loved ones and so forth. And uh, that's kind of one of the pl points where people will think about this most. Um, unfortunately, today it seems like there's a lot of counselors today that, that uh, tell people, to, uh, encourage people to make, to make peace with death. Well, as Paul's talking about here, death is not something to make peace with. De death is an enemy. Yeah, death is always bad. That it's the opposite of the life that God created for us. And, you know, it's always an enemy, but it's a conquered enemy in, in Christ. And, and we'll get, he'll get into that a little bit more as he goes, goes on here. Um, and I guess this also kind of gets into one of the, the things that will set Lutherans apart from, from others is our understanding of original sin. Uh, the depth of original sin and, and how much that that has a hold on us that even with that if we could somehow not commit an actual sin we still are sinful um, because we inherited that sin from Adam from uh, from Adam and Eve from that first sin he's kind of pointing to Adam here because he's going to be um, doing a correlation between Adam and Christ and you know I grew up in a tradition that uh, really denied original sin, at the very least in practice. And this tradition is one where they believed in an age of accountability. Okay. Yeah. This idea that if you were to ask them, well, uh, is anybody saved um, outside of faith in Jesus Christ? And they would say, no, of course. You, in order to be saved, you have to believe. And you go, oh, okay, good. So you baptize your babies. Oh, no, no, we don't baptize babies. Well, why not? Well, because you can't be baptized until you're able to confess your faith. So they can't confess their faith. Nope. And then when they can confess their faith, then we'll baptize them. Okay. Well, then what happens if they die before they're baptized? Well, God overlooks that because they don't really know right from wrong. They don't. They don't have. They're not at the age of reason, and therefore they're saved anyway because they're innocent. But then you said they can't have faith in Christ, but they're also saved. So now we have someone who's we have someone who's saved outside of faith in Christ. So then the big question, just what you brought up, is really brought to a head when you bring up death. If death is the wages of sin, that is death 
exist in this world and we die because of sin, then why do why do babies and children die? And the sad reality is that because they too are sinful, all of us, death spread to all men, all people, because all have sinned. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one to come. Adam is a type of the one to come. Who is that? Well, that is Jesus Christ. It's the Sunday school answer, right? (laughs) Yeah, that's Jesus. Yeah, let's read the next few verses here and see how he connects Adam to Jesus. I already read verse 15, but we'll read it again. But the free gift is not like the trespass, for if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God, and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin, for the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification." For if, because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to the condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Now, the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That finishes out the chapter So Adam, we said, is a type of the one to come. That's the type of Jesus. But he says the free gift's not like the trespass. Well, the the free gift is um, much greater and much better than anything that Adam could ever do to us. The effects of Adam certainly were were great on us, but if many died through the the one man's trespass, so many more by the grace of God and how that, that grace of God, it just keeps piling up there. I think it's amazing when we think about the fact that Jesus Christ came and his salvation, his his work on the cross forgives the sins of the whole world. Now, of course, you don't get the benefit of that forgiveness outside of faith in him. But yeah, you know, if we if we think about the unfairness that some people see in the idea that just because Adam and Eve fell into sin, we all inherit sin in perpetuity until Christ returns, you know, the world looks at that and says, that's just not fair. Why should I be punished for what Adam did? And yet, of course, this fallen human nature clings to sin. We are driven to sin by our concupiscence, that is a desire to sin. But Paul's pointing out that as awful as that is, and it is awful because sin is awful, how great, how great is the free gift of grace by Jesus Christ. Jesus is the new Adam, the one who hasn't abandoned God's will, the one who hasn't given in to temptation, the one who kept the law perfectly, and the one who sacrificed himself for the sins of the world. But there are people who don't like this idea that because Adam sinned, death reigns now throughout the world and sin is passed on to our children— How do we point to Christ? How do we take that message where they feel hopeless because of the sin that they inherited and connect that to the redemption that we receive from Jesus? Well, that that sin, uh, wherever its source, whether it came from Adam, we can trace it back there, the original sin or or our actual sins of thought, word, and deed, uh, those sorts of things, every single one of those sins has been paid for by by Christ. It wasn't just Adam's sins and where we start with a blank slate and and go from there, but but it's uh, every single one of those sins that that has been paid. And... uh, uh, it's given to us as a gift, and and with a gift, what do you do to get a gift? You, you know, you don't beg for it. You you don't work for it. That all you do is put out your hands and receive the gift. 
Now, my kids might disagree that you don't. (laughs) No, of course, we know exactly what you mean. That is that, you know, it's not a gift if it's your wages, if you do something for it. And it's and we actually can't like my children might beg for certain gifts. And they do if they're listening. They're not. Uh, But but we can't even by our own natural fallen state beg for the gift that God gives us. The natural man does not acknowledge the things of God, except, you know, as the small catechism says, that we have to be called by the Holy Spirit to have that faith. And so the gift that we get from God is absolutely, uh, completely non-contingent. I don't think that's a word, but non-contingent on uh, us doing something. It is all that completely free gift. In fact, whenever I type the word, like say in a sermon, into Microsoft Word and I write free gift, I don't know if this happens to you. Yes, it does. But Word goes, (laughs) that's redundant. Don't write redundant sentences. It's boring or something like that. And why are we being redundant? Why is Paul being redundant? Um, Because if it's free, it's a gift. And if it's not free, it's not a gift. Well, obviously for emphasis. You know, we didn't ask for or want the sin that we inherited from Adam. But we got it anyway. (laughs) But we desire deeply the free gift from Christ, but only because we have been convicted by the law and then drawn to Christ by the gospel. Our salvation is 100% God's work. Now, what's really interesting, I think, about the nature of God's forgiveness and what he works through baptism is that baptism covers not only the sins up to the point we were baptized, but the forgiveness we received in baptism is still there even after, right? We can call upon Christ and receive forgiveness even after our baptism. And the reason I bring that up is because there was an ancient practice when people were misled by this that people would wait to be baptized. They would wait till they absolutely couldn't wait any longer, even on their deathbeds, with the idea that you know, it's a easy way to get out of get out of hell free card, right? If I could just get baptized, that'll forgive all my sins. And since I have to now pay penance or make up for the sins that I commit after my baptism, well, then I have to wait as long as I can, so I have less penance to make up for. Of course, that's a misguided notion. While we certainly want to make amends for the sins, the actual sins, as you mentioned, that we commit after our baptisms. Um, It is that baptism that not only gives us forgiveness, but bestows upon us faith. It's God's word incarnate. So there is that one trespass in verse 18 where we are so upset, the fact that condemnation for all men, all people came from that one trespass so that one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. And he explains that in more detail as he goes through. Now, it says that the law came in to increase the trespass. Now, he does say that where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. But if the law is the good work of God, how does the law increase trespass? As I was preparing for this, there, there's a, a couple of different ways in, in which you might look at that. One, one of the ways uh, of it is that uh, the, the law continuously reveals our sin, and so it, it increases the tres- our realization of the trespass there. But there's also part of our, our sinful nature that kind of rebels at the law, too, and so that, that there can be an, an escalation, if you will, from that, too. So if I'm driving down the road and I want to go as fast as I as I can, as long as I don't know what the law is, then I'm not sinning? <laughs> no, there's a, no. ignorance of the law is no excuse, right? right. I think <laughs> ignorance of the law is no excuse is a, a, is a true doctrine of the American justice system. <laughs> but you know what? You're right. It absolutely applies to the scriptures too because he says earlier that sin – existed even before the law was given. Mm -hmm. But I like how you put that where when we are aware of the law, we also are more aware of our sins. And so in that manner, our sins increase. So if I was ignorant of speeding, so here in Minnesota, 
For those of you who don't know, we are very close to the South Dakotan border. And so if you – once you cross the South, South Dakotan border, the speed limit increases from 70 to 80, which I think is amazing, which means I get to increase from the 80 that I was going to 90. Uh, no, of course. I always follow the speed limits. But if I'm coming back into Minnesota and I sort of miss the fact that I've crossed the state lines, I could be uh, I could be speeding and not really aware of it. Well, the law helps me recognize that I'm doing something wrong. So you're absolutely right. It makes the sin more apparent and therefore it abounds all the more. But the more we recognize our sin, the more opportunities we have to then appeal to the grace of God and therefore grace abounds all the more. I think that's another issue that we see in our culture that's so tough for us as Christians to communicate to the outside world. This idea that even if you aren't aware that something is sinful to God, it's still sinful. And just because God, the law, or a friendly Christian is making you aware that something you're doing is not what God wants, it doesn't mean that they hate you and it doesn't mean that they want you to feel bad. But you're going to feel bad as you recognize that, yeah, I guess I am a sinner and I need the grace. We proclaim the law, though, for the purposes of proclaiming the gospel. But the second part you said – now, I I didn't quite hear that. So you said the first part was the – it it makes us more aware of our sins and therefore it increases. But the second part, something about rebellion. Uh, It becomes in effect of the law. It's not that the law causes it to happen, but our sinful nature causes it to happen. Our sinful nature is rebellious. You're right. I think Paul says something about, you know, if he didn't know what it meant to be covetous, you know, or knowledge of the law caused him to be covetous. Uh, You know, I. but the reality is there. Our sinful natures take even God's good, good direction of this is how I want you to live your life, say the Ten Commandments. And when our sinful fallen nature, which we still struggle with even after we're redeemed, we look at that, yeah, it's tempted to say, well, I want to push those boundaries. I, I think going back, talking about kids I, I, with children, I think that you can kind of do that, that you can tell your child not to do such and such. And they might have not even thought of that for a while, but then once, it, once the thought is there, it's, oh, wonder why I can't do that or, or move on from there. I think that's an excellent example. It reminds me of one time I was at Lutheran Island Camp when I – at my very first call, and we took some confirmation age students there. And we had a speaker, and she was talking about the Sixth Commandment and sexual sins. And she was talking about how people often come to her and want her to draw the line. Right. So what exactly constitutes a violation of the Sixth Commandment? You know, does holding hands – does kissing before you're married, does – and they get more and more explicit, getting closer and closer to you know outright sexual activity. And she says she doesn't like to answer those questions because the reason why they're asking them is because they want to know where the line is so that they can get as close to it as they can. And you're right. That's what our sinful human natures do. We want to say, well – Gossiping, for instance, is against God's desire for my life. It's a sin. Well, then I'm not going to gossip. I'm just going to share news or I'm going to share information so that we can pray for them. Down south, we just – as long as you end it with bless their heart, it's not gossip. But the truth is, of course, it often is. Sometimes even our prayer chains can be full of gossip because that's just how the human nature works. But – Thanks be to God that Christ died even while we were still sinners. In the next few minutes that we the, – just the last couple of minutes that we have in our program, what is one key message about this text that you would want to make sure that the listeners knew? Or maybe there's something that we didn't hit that you'd like to go back to before we conclude today. I th- I think that uh, I probably would look at going back to again just kind of the switch even at the at the first part here after Paul's been talking been talking about um, being justified and what that what that means in our life uh, but he uh, it, 
He also doesn't paint it as uh, it's uh, n- now you're justified, you're free and clear that, that that's all that all the that there is there that there's still going to be this this struggle with sin that that goes on, and we get that a little bit more as we go later in in Romans. Um, but to keep remembering that because we've been justified by faith. We have peace with God uh, through Jesus Christ and uh, that we also have access by faith to this grace and, uh, and, and so that we, um, and then the, the process that it work, works within us. And we see the, you, you asked about the suffering before and the, the suffering being part of that, the, the, the struggle uh, that brings actual growth. Absolutely. Whenever we talk about struggle It reminds me of Luther's Tentatio when he explained that there are three rules for being a theologian or studying God's word, oratio, meditatio, and temptatio. And of course, we have oratio, which is praying to God, and meditatio, studying the word, but then tentatio. Not a lot of people like that part. That's a Latin word, which is kind of like tension. You know, a struggle wrapped up with this is this idea of trials and temptations and all the persecutions that we go through in this life. And yet the things that we endure in this life because of Christ, we can connect them to God disciplining us, drawing us closer to him so that even in our struggles, as St. Paul says, they will eventually produce character. And so, yeah, not a lot of people like the tentatio of Luther's three ways to become a theologian, but that's definitely a part of what Paul is talking about here in this passage. So our struggles can certainly be used by God for our benefit. Our study this morning began with the inspired words, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus. Jesus Christ. That, dear friends, is God's answer to our tentatio, our struggles, and our sin. Complete and utter justification because of Christ. This is the law and gospel message for you this morning, dear saints of God. If you're feeling burdened by the weight of your sins, if the circumstances of life are bringing you down, if you're worried about the future, God has given you an answer to all of these things. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Death is the wages of sin, but our Lord and Savior suffered death on our behalf and is victorious over it. Christ is risen, and he has ascended and is returning soon. Until then, cling to the cross of Christ, which forgives your sins. Stay close to the new Adam, whose sacrifice has redeemed the whole world. Thank you for tuning in to Thy Strong Word, and thank you to my guest this morning, the Reverend Robert Moeller of the Three Strands Parish, Our Savior Lutheran Church in Pipestone, those at Zion Lutheran Church in Jasper, Minnesota, and those saints at St. John Lutheran Church in Trosky, Minnesota. Brother, it's been great exploring God's Word across the desk from you today. I tell you what, why don't you and I head out and get some lunch. It's going to be my treat. And as for you, dear listeners, thanks for joining us as we continue to study Paul's letter to the Romans. No matter how you tune in, whether it's over the air, online, through KFUO's app, maybe your own favorite podcasting app, do me a favor. Send me an email at pastorboo at gmail.com. I'd love to hear from you. Spread the word about the program to your churches, your friends, your family, and your neighbors. And not just this program, but any of KFUO's great programs. Anyone who would benefit from getting deeper in the word. Until God gathers us together again, may the peace of Christ dwell richly in each of you. See you next time.